the miracles of Lourdes saved my faith when I was younger, and remembering that I have put together miracles for moderns, dealing with certain great miracles, continuing miracles, to which science has given a new significance for the 20th century. When God suspends the laws of nature, I'm sure his purpose is shock treatment to jolt us back to faith. So the sick are cured at Lourdes, just as Christ cured the sick, and the blind see and the lame walk, so that we may be jolted back to faith when faith falters in a godless world. In the presence of the host turned to flesh, and of the sacred heart, and of wine turned to blood that redeemed us, Next to the real presence we have the treasure of the face of the shroud and Jesus is no longer an elusive stranger but a person, a real person of noble countenance still noble in death. The miraculous painting of Mary is a gift that converted the Aztec nation but its mission is for today's world also. Today, her old enemy, the serpent Satan, is loose and triumphant in a world that's spiritually dead. And the same serpent knows that in his hour of greatest triumph, the same heel will crush his head. I am positive that God gave us this beautiful painting of Mary and also the stark photo of Jesus in death to help us through this devil's age of unbelief. Just as I'm positive, and he sent the Queen of Prophets to Fatima to deliver a warning and an ultimatum unparalleled by the prophets of old to a world that has gone too far. As a good priest said to me recently, if these are miracles, we have a duty to make them known. In 1519, the Spanish conquistador Hernando Cortes landed with a small army in what is now Mexico. He found an advanced civilization, the Aztec Empire, of nine million people under the Emperor Montezuma. In many ways, the Aztecs were the equal of European civilization, but with a barbaric pagan religion, which included human sacrifice. Human sacrifice to the sun god Huitzilopochtli and the stone serpent Quetzalcoatl. The conquest of the Aztec Empire by Cortes with his tiny Spanish army is an amazing story. The conquest was helped by a paralysis of Montezuma's will to resist because Montezuma half believed that Cortes was the embodiment of the prophesied white-skinned, bearded priest of Quetzalcoatl who was prophesied to return from the dead and take over the empire and also because Montezuma's sister, the Princess Papantzin, had had a vision in which she had seen great ships approaching. On their sails were black crosses, like the cross carried by Cortes, and she had been told that those ships were bringing men who would conquer the Aztec nation and bring to its people knowledge of the true God, and that she, the princess, would be the first to receive the waters of baptism. Cortes conquered the Aztec Empire and destroyed the pagan idols and temples, but generally the pagan gods still ruled the minds of the Aztec Indians and they resisted Christianity. A few Indians converted to Christianity and among the first to be baptized was the Princess Papantzin. Another was an Indian man who took the Christian name Juan Diego. Well, now that the Indians had become part of the Spanish Empire, their culture was fused with European culture to build a new nation, Mexico. But after the conquest, some cruel administrators followed Cortes, and the Indians were on the point of revolt, and they were then capable of annihilating the Spaniards. But the uprising never happened. Instead, in a short time, Indians and Spaniards were united politically and religiously. How did it happen? And why did it happen? You won't find the answers in the history books. In 1531, the Blessed Virgin came personally 
She came to a spot near the capital, now Mexico City. She came to the exact geographical center of the Americas. She was coming not just for Mexico, but for the Americas, the New World. The Indians generally wanted nothing to do with the new Christianity. The missionaries had been having a lean time. They, there'd been very few converts, but among that few was our hero, Juan Diego. On a Saturday morning, December the 9th, 1531, he was walking in open country on his way to attend a special mass for the Blessed Virgin. He heard music, heavenly music, coming from Tipayac Hill. Puzzled, he looked towards the top of the little hill where the dawn was breaking. Suddenly the singing ceased, and in the silence he heard his name called. He felt no fear, but with a strange joy he climbed the hill. And there he saw a lady of superhuman magnificence. Her garments radiated light, so that the stony ground shone like a rainbow. Even the miserable bushes were glittering. Juan Diego knelt and the lady spoke in a gentle voice. The words sound quaint to us, but in their conversation, she and Juan Diego used the native idiom for conveying both affection and esteem. Her first words were, Juanito, the smallest of my children, where are you going? And he answered, My lady and my child, I must go to your house in Mexico, Tlatelico. The lady went on in a, in a long speech, which I must abbreviate. She said, Be it known and understood by you, the smallest of my children, that I am the ever-virgin, holy Mary, mother of the true God. I ardently desire that a temple be built for me here, where I can show and offer all my love and protection, for I am your merciful mother. I wish to hear and help you and all those who dwell in this land, and all those others who love me. The lady bade Juan Diego to go to the bishop and tell him of her wish that a temple be built. So Juan went off to the bishop's palace. After some delay, he was allowed to see Bishop Zumaraga. He knelt before the bishop and told him of the apparition and the request for a temple. The bishop was not convinced. Juan Diego sensed this when the bishop concluded the interview with the words, You shall come again, my son, and I will hear what you have to say at greater leisure. I shall look into the matter carefully. So Juan departed, and he went back to the hill of Tipayac. There the lady was awaiting him. He fell to his knees and said, Lady, smallest of my daughters, my child, I went where you sent me to carry out your order. And then he explained that the bishop had received him kindly, but that he had failed to convince the bishop. He begged the lady to choose someone else, someone important, to take the message to the bishop, instead of himself, one of the little, unimportant people. He pleaded, My lady, you send me where I am out of place, where I have no standing. Forgive me if I cause you much grief, and if I make you angry with me my lady and my mistress. But the lady ever so gently assured him that she could choose anyone, but that she had chosen him to help her and to make known her wish. My little son, she said, I urge you and I firmly order you to go again to the bishop tomorrow. Tell him again that I in person, the ever-virgin Holy Mary, the Mother of God, send you. Juan Diego replied that he would gladly go to the bishop again, but he also made it clear that he doubted that the bishop would believe him, that he doubted that the bishop would even listen to him. And Juan Diego took his leave in that quaint idiom. He said, I must now be on my way, my little daughter, my child and my lady. Rest well in the meantime. And he was gone. Next day was Sunday. After Mass, Juan Diego went to the bishop's palace and he was allowed to see the bishop. He again told the bishop of Our Lady's request and orders. But the bishop exercised prudent caution. 
He said he could not build a temple on the basis of Juan Diego's word. He must have a sign, a sign to confirm that the message came from heaven. So away went Juan again. However, this time, as he departed, the bishop assigned some trusted persons to follow him, to shadow him. But somehow they lost sight of him near the hill. Baffled, they reported back to the bishop that he'd slipped out of their sight, and they persuaded the bishop that Juan Diego was probably deceiving them all and was not to be trusted. In fact, Juan had walked back to meet the lady again, and he discussed with her the bishop's answer. The lady replied, My little son, you shall return here tomorrow for the sign that he's requested. Then he will believe and no longer doubt or suspect you. Tomorrow I shall be waiting for you here. But tomorrow brought a new problem, and Juan Diego failed to keep that appointment. On the morrow, his uncle was taken with a sudden sickness, and Juan spent the day nursing the dying man. The day came and it went, and he failed to keep his appointment with the lady. Early the following day, he set forth to bring a priest to his dying uncle. In his urgency, he decided that he must avoid passing the hill of Tipayak, just in case he might meet the lady there, and the delay might result in his uncle dying without a priest. So he changed to a different road. But it was too late. The lady was already approaching him from the side of the hill. Worried about his uncle and embarrassed at missing yesterday's appointment, Juan Diego's greeting was a classic of confusion. He bowed and he said, My child, my littlest daughter, I hope you are well and happy. Did you sleep well? Are you in good humor and health, my lady and my little daughter? Well, having got that much off his chest, the good man went on to explain that he was hurrying to get a priest for his dying uncle. And he added, Please excuse me and be patient. I shall not deceive you, my daughter, littlest of all. Tomorrow, tomorrow I shall come here in all haste. Well, the lady comforted Juan. She promised him that his uncle was at that moment cured. And actually the uncle was suddenly cured at that time. And Juan Diego believed the lady, and he worried no more about his uncle. He asked for a sign to take to the bishop. Our lady told him to go to the top of the hill and gather the flowers he'd find there. Flowers on the hilltop, impossible. He knew that no flower had ever grown on that barren hilltop, but obediently he climbed the hill, and there he beheld, on the hard, stony ground, masses of flowers. Not ordinary flowers, but masses of magnificent Castilian roses blooming there where no flower had ever grown. He gathered an armful and he took them down the hill to the lady. And she, like a good housekeeper, herself rearranged the roses in his cloak. She told him, My little son, these roses are the sign and the proof that you shall take to the bishop. You shall tell him everything very carefully. But when one arrived at the bishop's palace, the attendants treated him as a nuisance and would not take him to the bishop. Then they noticed that he had something in his cloak, so he had to show them the roses. They tried to grab them, but three times their hands closed on nothingness, and the roses seemed to change, seemed to become not real flowers, but flowers painted or embroidered on the cloak. Now this was too unnerving, so they took Juan Diego to the bishop. Juan knelt before the bishop, and again he spoke the lady's message. He told of roses blooming where no rose could bloom, heavenly roses which he'd brought to the bishop as the sign from the lady. Behold them, he cried, receive them. He opened his cloak, and the roses tumbled to the floor. The bishop stared and fell to his knees, and so did all those present. But no one was looking at the roses now. They were gazing at something else on Juan Diego's cloak. 
As the roses dropped to the floor, there suddenly appeared on his cloak a colourful painting of a beautiful young lady. She stood against a background of light. Juan Diego wondered why they were all kneeling and gazing. Then he looked down at his cloak and he saw it, an exact picture of the beautiful lady. The bishop, with tears in his eyes, finally took the cloak and retired with it to pray. That night, Juan Diego stayed at the bishop's palace. The next day, Juan took the bishop to the place of the apparitions, and the bishop arranged for a church to be built there. But another wonder still awaited them. They went on to visit Juan Diego's uncle. They found him cured, the fever gone without a trace. The uncle told them of this new wonder. A beautiful lady had appeared to him on his sickbed, and suddenly he'd been made well. Thereupon, the lady had instructed him to inform the bishop that she wished her image to be called the ever-virgin Holy Mary of Guadalupe. For the new chapel was built and the flood of converts was starting. And then came Mary's new intervention in a climactic gesture to her beloved Indians. December the 26th, 1531, a great procession carried the miraculous painting to its new chapel. Bishop Zumaraga, Bishop Garces, members of the new Spanish government, and Hernando Cortes himself were there. They mixed with the Indians, conquerors and conquered, embraced before the Blessed Sacrament, and a new nation was being born. Then tragedy struck. During a symbolic dance, an arrow pierced the neck of an Indian man and killed him. They brought his body. With great sorrow, they laid it beneath the painting. <clears throat> and the great crowd prayed fervently. And in answer, the dead man stirred and was restored to life. The Aztecs' writing was not alphabetical like ours. Theirs was a picture writing. On the painting are several touches which could have been interpreted by the Indians as pictograph messages. However, recently, infrared tests have been made which have shown that they were added by human hands. The report is in a new book, The Guadalupe Madonna, by Jody Brandt Smith, an assistant professor of humanities and philosophy in Florida. He, with a Dr. Philip S. Callahan, carried out infrared photographic tests on the painting. The book explains the results of those tests and also the results of computer enhancement procedures done by a Dr. Jose Aste Tuzman. In my original lecture, I relied on the then current literature which regarded those touches as part of the miracle painting touches which conveyed the following messages to the Indians. The lady was obliterating the sun. Thus, she was obliterating the sun god, Huitzilopochtli. So, out with Huitzilopochtli. She stood on a burned-out crescent moon, and a crescent moon was the Indian's pictogram for the terrible god Quetzalcoatl. So, Quetzalcoatl was finished. With these two gods removed, there remained no god demanding human sacrifice. The Indians realized they were free of the scourge of human sacrifice. Then, at the lady's feet is an angel, so the lady must be of heaven. The lady's robes are blue-green in color, the color belonging to divinity, and the borders of her robe are edged in gold which signifies royalty, divinity and royalty. She must be of the royalty of heaven. Yet, she is not the ruler of heaven. She is not God. Why? Because her hands are joined in prayer and her head is bowed. Who then is she? Who is her God? The Indians found the answer in her brooch with its black cross, the same cross they had seen on the banners of Cortes, the cross which the missionaries carried, the same cross which the Indian princess had seen in her vision years before, the cross of Christianity. 
The Indians saw the miraculous painting and they flocked in their thousands, in their millions, to embrace Christianity. Within seven years of Our Lady's apparition, at least eight million Indians came for baptism and confirmation. They belonged to twelve different nations and they spoke several languages. Eight million in seven years, a nation converted in a flash. Nothing equals it in the history of the Church. In her simple way, the Mother of Christ had crushed the tyranny of Quetzalcoatl, the stone serpent, and had brought an empire of souls into the mystical body of her divine Son. Under the one true God, she united Spaniard and Indian in the religious and political brotherhood. The threatened revolt never happened. Instead, Indian and Spaniard went on to build Mexico into a great Catholic nation. Now, faced with the information in the new book, what is to be said about the pictographs? The infrared tests have now shown that those pictograph touches were added to the miraculous painting by human hands. But when were they added? It has to be less than 40 years after the miracle, because 40 years after the miracle, a copy of the painting was aboard a Christian ship in the great Sea Battle of Lepanto. That copy is today in Mexico City, and it contains the pictograph touches which the human artist added to the miraculous original. There must have been a practical reason, a good reason and purpose, to motivate somebody to dare to put an earthly paintbrush on the heavenly original. My only theory and it may be quite wrong, is that reasonably soon after the miracle, someone, perhaps an Indian painter of that period, added the extras with the purpose of adding a pictographic message for the Indians. Now the additions include the gold sun rays, the angel, the crescent moon, and the fold of Our Lady's tilma over the moon, the brooch with its black cross, also the 46 stars on Our Lady's mantle, and the gold trim of the mantle. However, note that all these additions in no way affect any significant areas of the miraculous image. Well, so much for the added touches. Let's consider now the miraculous painting and what is miraculous about it. Firstly, Juan Diego's cloak is made of vegetable fibre from a cactus plant. Such cloth has a life of less than 20 years. It should have disintegrated within 20 years. Yet there it is, in Mexico City, as good as when Juan Diego first put it on four and a half centuries ago. All the rules of art are broken. For instance, no sizing was used to prepare the rough cloth for the painting. For instance, there is no under-sketching, whereas a human portrait painter will always first sketch the form and features before painting a subject. There is no under-sketching. For instance, the colours themselves baffle the experts. The colours should have faded with time or maybe the extras added by human hands could have been retouched to freshen them up, but not so the main painting. There can be no retouching there. And those colours should be dull and faded, and with hairline cracks. Instead, they remain perfect. This is especially remarkable because for the first 116 years, the painting was not covered by glass. It was exposed to winds that blow across Lake Texcoco, winds laden with humidity and saltpeter that can corrode rocks and iron and other paintings. Also, for over a century, thousands of rough and sweaty hands caressed the painting. Even nitric acid was accidentally spilled on it. But there it is, after four and a half centuries, as fresh as if the paints had scarcely dried. Furthermore, there's the 
humanly impossible blend of watercolour and oil paint. That is, if they are watercolour and oil paint, because nobody seems to know just what the pigments are. The pigments are inexplicable and confound the experts. And then there's the face. Oh, that face. Viewed close up, it's flat and disappointing. But as you move away from the painting, the flat pigments of face and hands somehow, mysteriously, combine with the rough surface of the unsized cloth, diffracting the light into an olive green skin tone. And suddenly you see the overwhelming beauty of the olive skinned Madonna. Now this is beyond the skills of any human painter. The painting has many marvels, but the most mysterious are hidden in the eyes. Back in 1929, enlarged photographs revealed the reflected image of a man's head in the right eye of the painting. Now, in a human eye, an image is reflected in three places, cornea, front of lens, and rear of lens. Now, in 1956, two experts confirmed that the image of the man's head is reflected in the right eye of the painting in three places, positioned exactly as if in a human eye. Also, and this is remarkable, it was found that if the light of an ophthalmoscope was shone into the pupil of an eye of the painting, the painted eye gave off a luminous reflection just as would occur in a, in a human eye. More recently, in 1979-1980, the method of computer enhancement was used, and it revealed that the man's head is reflected in both eyes, but needs the computer enhancement to pick it up in the left eye. The computer also revealed another face reflected in both eyes, but more clearly in the left eye this time than in the right. It's a face with a beard and a balding head, and it's claimed to bear some resemblance to Bishop Zumaraga. Furthermore, the computer showed what looked like several other human forms reflected in the eyes. What impresses the expert observers is this. The reflections of the, of the respective images are positioned in the eyes of the painting in the precise positions required by the laws of optical geometry. Through 20th century science, the painting reveals new marvels to confound 20th century godlessness. Today, in a world as pagan as that of the pagan Aztecs, the ancient painting has a new mission, to bring a supernatural message to a world that is losing its sense of the supernatural. People who have seen the actual painting declare that pictures of it never capture the beauty of the original. Let me quote Coley Taylor. The expression of Our Lady's face is altogether indescribable. It is so tender, so loving, so human in her enigmatic smile, far more challenging than that of the famed Mona Lisa of Leonardo. Reproductions do not convey the gentleness and softness of the moulding of the eyes and lips. In some reproductions, the eyes seem to bulge, and the lips almost to pout. But there's nothing of that in the original. The contours are all lovely, and the great feature is, of course, the eyes, which do not look like painted eyes in a portrait, but really living human eyes with the proper eye contours. And always there's the tremendous sense of presence, a magnetic graciousness that has never been my experience with any other painting. There is nothing comparable to Our Lady's portrait. She left something of her presence with it. Now that was Coley Taylor. And that's all there is to say. Thanks to modern photography, Our Lady's portrait has now been brought to the whole world, to you and to me.
something not available to other centuries. But though our pictures and our slides bring us much of this treasure, something extra is reserved for those few who can make the pilgrimage and look on the original itself, the miraculous painting of a beautiful young Jewess, the very same face that the young Jesus looked at and loved. And that ends the first section. Thank you.